I want to talk a little bit about values in American foreign policy, but I'll skip over that. How do we appeal to these, someone asked me at lunch today, how do we appeal to the radical Islams in the world? I, it's not complicated, let me tell you a story. It's a political story. Every politician who holds office that I know is asked to do something by a constituent almost on a weekly, if not a daily basis. The constituent will ask him or her, the representative, to do something that is utterly impossible to do. I don't know a single successful politician who says to that person, I cannot help you. You know what you say? In the words of a successful politician, I feel your pain. <laughs> I'm on your side. I want to help you. That's a pretty good rule in American politics, and I don't think it's too simplistic to apply it to the world of foreign policy. When we deal with these, these countries across the world, we have to say to them, look, we know you want the same things we want. We want to grow up and marry the person of our choice. We want a good job. We want an education. We want good health. We want to have a family about us. We can't solve all your problems. We're not smart enough. We're not rich enough. But we want to help you. That's the way you win friends and respect with all sorts of ways that I could suggest, but won't we have to be pragmatic about these things, but we have to let them know that America stands as a beacon of hope and opportunity in the world, and we are the most powerful nation in the world, not because of the strength of our arms or the money in our banks, but because we have served as a beacon of hope and opportunity in the world. And when this country was founded, it sparked a new era and new form of representative government and constitutional democracy. And when we opened up our doors wide to the immigrants in the 19th century, we became a destination of hope for people around the world. And when we stood up to the Soviets through the Cold War, there was little doubt to which side of the Iron Curtain most of the world wanted to live on. And our power was the power of persuasion in, in example. Two more points and I'll be done. American foreign policy has to rest on a strong domestic foundation. If our economic growth is robust, it encourages other nations to adopt market economies. If we are less dependent upon foreign oil and gas, we would not be so tied to events in the Middle East as we have been for decades. If we did not have a substantial deficit in trade, like we do with China and other countries. We would not be so dependent upon them to bail us out, and we would have more freedom of action in economic affairs, and if we were only more united and less polarized in this country, we'd be better able to tackle the great challenges that are before us. So you have to have a strong domestic base to conduct American foreign policy. The final point I want to make is this. I hope the next President of the United States will not be dismissive of the views of the American people. Let's not kid ourselves. There is a powerful strain of elitism in American foreign policy, a feeling by policymakers that the American people are not well informed about complex matters that they are not able to master the subject matter, that they are guided by passion and not intellect, and that the country is better served by leaving such serious matters to the elites. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times, Hamilton, trust me. Or, Hamilton, if you only knew the intelligence that I knew. I think we would be better off to follow the admonition of the psalmist. Put not your faith in princes. I picked up a poll the other day. 
What did the people want? The people, number one, wanted us to disengage from Iraq responsibly. Number two, they want us to take out, that's right, take out Osama bin Laden. Number three, they want us to engage in diplomacy, even with those people we don't like. Number four, they want the people, they want America to be less dependent upon foreign oil. Number five, they want us to maintain strong alliances. And I read down through that list, and you know what I said to myself? I used an Indiana phrase. Maybe they use it in Illinois, too. That was a down-home judgment. Good common sense. Look, I don't romanticize that the American people are always right. I do suggest that the policymaker sometimes needs a harness and that we should not invariably put our trust in princes. So the next president has a formidable challenge. I have worked with a number of presidents, some in my party, the Democratic Party, some in the Republican Party. I have never, ever wanted an American president to fail. I want an American president to succeed. I hope this president will restore respect. I hope this president will see the urgent need for U.S. leadership. I hope this president will see that we need help as we tackle these problems. I hope the next president will understand that we've got to do a better job of carrying out our policy. I hope the next president will see that, sure, you've got to have a strong military, but you've got to have a strong non-military use of power, and you've got to integrate all of the tools of American power in order to have effective American foreign policy. I hope the next American president will promote our key values like freedom and justice across the world. And I hope that next president will not be dismissive of the views of the American people. We need to recognize the significant dangers in front of us and identify those challenges and seize the opportunities, magnificent opportunities that await us. Thank you very much. You're watching the Illinois Channel an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. If you have any comments or questions on our programming, please email us at illinoischannel at aol.com. Or if you have any questions about the Illinois Channel, please visit our website at www.illinoischannel.org.